guy, Chris Polar, he's mentioned on, I think, most of your albums in the liner notes as yes. you, know, you give thanks to him. I know the feeling of having a mentor. I owe my mentor so much, you know, and I've, yes. I have distinct memories of certain moments where something was unlocked through a oh, yeah. piece of advice. So I'm wondering, can you share some of these moments? Well, um, there were many because, first of all, this guy was unusual. He was a Bay Area musician, but in those days, a lot of musicians came from the East Coast and they didn't bring a bass player, maybe. So he got to play with Wes Montgomery. Mm. He even got to play with Elvin, and I never got to play with Elvin. He played with Chet Baker. Uh, he played, I think, with Earl Fa Father Hines. Um, he played with Art Pepper. All these different people he got to play with. He said the most frightening week of his life was, I think, he subbed for Eddie Gomez in the Bill Evans Trio for like a few nights. Wow. And he said he was in way over his head. He could barely hang on. The main thing that he did for me, aside, well, he did many things he taught me, but one of the hugest things was I didn't want to learn how to read music, and he forced me to learn. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine... Oh. He just said, you have to do this. Otherwise, you won't be able to play with all these players. And so he made me do it. Like he kept putting stuff in front of me to read yeah. and forcing me to do it. And he'd get mad at me because if he fidgeted and played some of it, I would hear it and play it. Yeah. So he really forced me to learn how to read over time. Which is ironic because then when I became a studio musician. I, I mean, I really learned to read. Yeah. But, but when people would say that to him, oh, man, he can really read, he would just start laughing because he remembers when I couldn't read anything and I would be counting the lines and the spaces mm -hmm. trying to figure it out. I was horrible. I always tell my students, if they're struggling with reading, I said, don't worry, I was the worst in the history of music. I was terrible. Wait, you haven't heard me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had to become strong at it because I wound up playing with all these people that write a yeah. lot of music and I became a studio guy too. Yeah. And that was demanded of you. Did Chris give you any tips on, on you know, because sometimes these high pressure situations are there when in fact, like a, like a great player puts something in front of you and you have to play it and you have to deliver. Did he have some advice on that or do you have something that you that is important to you in these kind of situations yeah there's a whole checklist because of all the experiences i've had in the recording studio i've learned so much i always tell my students get there early mm -hmm. because i used to do these big films i still do them i play on a lot of films so it used to be in la when i was very young breaking in it was petrified to do this stuff i mean you'd be in a big room big sound stage they would brought they would um project the film on the wall big huge screen you know on the wall and there were stand lights and you'd be reading and um so you'd get in the in there early and you'd look at the there would be a pile of music on your music stand like this thick of all the cues for the whole day And maybe it represented, if you were on a film for three days, maybe there was three days of cues or they kept adding them every day. So the trick that the older guys told me that were really incredible, I was around a lot of amazing session guys, they would say, make sure you, when you get there early and you look through the whole pile and find the hardest one and make yeah. sure you learn it. When you look at a new piece of music, you automatically have to check the meter, see if there are any meter changes, uh, tempo changes, dynamic changes. Um, and I started to learn how to group the music in sounds, harmonically, scales. So when I look at a piece of music, I'm immediately grouping the lines that I see into a sound. And most yeah. bass parts are like that. If you look carefully, you'll see the arpeggios and the scales that everything is derived from. Boom, it's right there. Huh. If you're paying attention, things tend to group in a certain way and they'll lay some, unless something is very open and through composed and completely, but usually there are strong tonalities in the bass part. Even if it's linear, really linear, it's obvious to me. I can, 
if you throw a piece of music in front of me, I'm already grouping. Yeah. And, stuff. and I'm looking for the hardest part, and I'm looking for all the tempo changes and, and the key changes and the awkward parts that are written badly for the bass. Yeah. Which there are many people who don't know how to write for the bass. So I call it the curse of Chick Corea. Many people have called me into their recordings and said, write written stuff that just is basically unplayable. And say, well, you can play this, right? You play with Chick. Yeah. I was like, wow, I don't know if I can play it. Especially when people started writing a lot of odd meter stuff. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that stuff, um, you know, you can tell when somebody writes some stuff when it's organic and it grooves like Danilo's music or yeah. somebody like... Um, uh, his student, the alto player Miguel Zanon, mm -hmm. uh, his music, or or Ed Simon. Um, I've played with these guys. They write music that has a groove and a lyricism, even though it's odd meter. There's a whole bunch of other people that tend to, I think, sit there and try to figure out the hardest thing they can write, and then they write it and torture people with it. Um, so <laughs> I've been on some recordings where, you know, they only have a day and they overwrite the record. So they wind up being totally stressed out. Half the time, they can't even play their own music. And those of us who are trained in this, you know, we'll get through the record. We'll be able to play it somehow. But at the end of it, you're like, I don't know. If, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think I'll ever remember one, met yeah. one of the melodies. But don't you also find that, um, like, great music although it might be very hard at times usually is more easy to read like if it's written really well it might yeah. be complex and hard to play but it's easier to read than something that is just somehow unnatural or not written well uh, yes. or yes. comes out of more of the brain right part totally like That's the misconception about Chick. They would say, well, you played all that stuff. Everything that Chick wrote for me, even the challenging stuff, I was able to find a fingering for that made it lay. Mm -hmm. Some were harder than others. But harmonically and melodically, and he never wrote in odd meters. He wrote in 4, 4, 3, 4, and 6, right. 8. So there wasn't uh, this heavy cerebral thing where you had to like sit there and study your part for a week before you could play it. Mm -hmm. But some of that stuff sounds so complicated, although it, played so it, naturally. But uh, I'm, I'm wondering about the rehearsal process with that band or with these bands. Well, that, that band was the electric band. Yeah. Everybody was a really good reader. Uh, Frank, maybe less so, but Frank would memorize everything on the guitar. Eric is a ridiculous reader, Eric Marienthal. Unbelievable. Mm. A lot of times Schick wouldn't even write a transposed part for the alto sax. Yeah. He would just sight transpose it. And that, those were hard things. Um, yeah, often the band was very good. I mean, we didn't do a lot of rehearsing. We had some rehearsing before the records or we would be out on the road and we played the music a lot. Mm -hmm. long tours a lot of tours hundreds and hundreds of gigs so and I got used to his style of writing mm -hmm. and then things I started to hear and understand harmonically and and the way he thought about things and then it just became natural yeah sometimes there were you know obviously some of those lines are really they don't lay that easy on the bass but they made so much sense. And they were all, like I said before, they were grouped in sounds and changes and linearly they were expressing things. They weren't oblique and detached. Yeah. You know. Hey there. Thanks for checking out the podcast. If you enjoy these conversations, please consider joining me on patreon.com slash Pablo Held for more educational videos lead sheets, early access to episodes, online hangouts, music recommendations, Bandcamp discount, and more behind the scenes stuff from the podcast. The generous support of my patrons helps me to pay for the running costs of this podcast 
and it helps me to keep it going into the future. All right, let's get back to the episode. But what would be like a um, a typical situation when Chick brings in a, a song, a tune? Uh, how would it how would it unfold? I had a lot of freedom. The bass players in his bands always had massive amounts of freedom. So, for instance, um, when he brought in, everybody talks about got a match because it was really this crazy line and everything. Yeah, I like a fool volunteered to play the melody. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. We were playing the song and I thought, well, maybe because it was at first it was a, just a trio, that band. Mm -hmm. And that was the reason why I got a six string bass. Because I felt like his music and we were a trio and I had to follow him soloing. Right, yeah. So I needed some another range orchestrationally i felt like i needed another higher range to get over the top of the keyboards which are thick and the drums which are thick and then i wanted the low notes because the keyboards he had all these synths and they was playing all these big low notes and i wanted to play the low notes right. too you know so it was an orchestrational choice that led me to the six string mm -hmm. and it was a big challenge to learn I mean, I didn't get it until two weeks before the big, the first big tour in 86, I believe, mm -hmm. where we really started going on the road. 85, we played some gigs. But, yeah. Phew, crazy. So yeah. he, he wouldn't really say a lot of things to you as a basis in terms of what he w wants from you or something. Yeah, some things, obviously, there were the comp the compositions that had lines for me to play or yeah. um, or counterpoint within a song or and then there were changes for other parts. Um, and we Dave and I came up with a lot of grooves. Uh, sometimes he would say, well, I want it to sort of feel like this um, in terms of he would play what he was going to play. And this is the field, but he didn't say, well, you have to play this and that. We would, he gave us a lot of freedom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because Miles was like that. He said Miles didn't really tell them a lot how to play yeah. or what to play. So he was the same, came from that school. I just yeah. listened to, I got a match uh, a couple of hours ago again, and it's, it sounds so great. It's so fresh. And also, I love that that second, like the sh almost shout chorus that happens in the drum solo, like the, yes. the other line. And I love that about Chick's music, that there's something, when you think you know what the song is, he'll throw something else at you that's still part of the song, and the, the song keeps on growing. Absolutely. When we first started playing that tune, there was just the melody. And there was no shout chorus yet. Mm -hmm. So one day, you know, we were, I was living in L.A. and so was Chick. And um, we were flying up to San Francisco for a gig. And that particular day, I think it was just two seats next to each other. I don't know where Dave was, but in the plane. But I was sitting right next to Chick and he, he took out a piece of music paper and he just started writing all this stuff. And I see all these eighth notes flying around on the paper. And finally I said, Chick, what's that, man? He said, oh, you'll see when we get to the gig. So we got to the sound check, and it was all those shout chorus lines. Beautiful. And we read them at the sound check, and we played them that night. And it was kind of scary. Um, but I remember doing it. Great. I was 25. What did I know? You know. <laughs> Beautiful. I was just full of uh, energy, and it was the perfect gig for me. I really wanted to play with him. I was trying to get that gig, mm -hmm. whatever it was. I didn't know the music. I just wanted to play with him because I knew I could play both instruments with him. Mm -hmm. I had been playing with Joe Farrell right, and Ayerto and other people that had played with him, and I kept asking Joe, when are the, doesn't he ever have auditions? He said, not really. He doesn't do that. So 
Yeah. Incredible. It's hard to believe that he actually slipped away like that, like the way he did. We didn't know anything about his. Yeah. Okay. Very unexpected. Yes. I mean, I didn't know him, but uh, uh, he always seemed so full of life and so yeah. energetic and never really. I mean, of course, he looked older after a while, but uh, he felt like a, whenever I saw him yeah. live or something, he felt like a young kid. Yeah. I it's love that something like Jeff Ballard pointed to me to to towards something that sometimes he felt like um, Chick wouldn't even have sat on the stool yet and he was already playing, you know, yeah, when yeah, they walked yeah. on stage. And that's something that I've tried to do myself now after Jeff told me about it, because sometimes there's this moment of you sit down on your stool and everything yeah, becomes yeah, serious. Yeah. And now yeah, yeah, I will yeah. play my first note. But if you just reach out while you're, you know, yeah, there's a there's an energy, and I really have to almost like every time now I sit on the piano bench after this this talk with Jeff, I feel I, I think about Chick actually. Yeah, well, he was very playful. You know, his idea was you have to invent games for yourself to play and do things that just keep you interested, and he was he never lost that childhood sp like spirit. Same with Wayne. Wayne is like a kid. He'll he just find stuff and it's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. What were some of the chick albums that were so important to you? It, it especially in that time where you were like pre prepping to finally get to play with him. Um well obviously the first one was huge. And also the trio records were great. One of the and and um one of the ones that were was very adventurous out of the electric band stuff was this record called Inside Out. Mm -hmm. It sounds like Bella Bartok meets the electric band. It's really like when we heard the demos, we were like, what is going on? How are we going to mm -hmm. play? I mean, it was like, what is this? We didn't know what to do. Um, and one of my favorite bands that I was in with him, too, was late later uh, was the one with Bob Berg and Gary Novak. Mm, yeah. There was a record called Time Warp. Mm -hmm. And then another record where they released, when we did Time Warp, we also recorded a bunch of standards too. And Chick had this amazing arrangement of that old feeling. It's mm -hmm. incredible. And uh, that band did some several tours of Europe. That was a great situation. Gary Novak is a great drummer. I really like it. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable killing yeah yeah totally um so all those records i mean and then then what he did for me was crazy i mean he he got me the record deal with grp so they didn't want to sign a bass player necessarily and he made them do it mm. and then he produced the first record with me and he just showed me how to make records. He said, I know you, he said, I believe in your writing and I know you want it. You kind of know what you want to do. So he said, I'm just there to help in any way. And I said, well, would you play? <laughs> <laughs> and he did. But he taught me how to make records too. How so to how, do you, how do you do a record? Man, he, he taught me how to be so organized, you know, make the budget out, figure out who you want to play, figure out what it's going to be. You know, he had a team too. He had a you know whole management group, mm -hmm. and then his manager became my manager, and so just he was very organized about everything. And the studio was part of the organization, of course, as it always is. But he gave me an incredible deal. We had a lockout at Mad Hatter, his studio in L.A., and it was like you come in at 6 p.m. and you can stay till 9 a.m. Wow. And it's 600 bucks. Pretty good. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. Amazing for the time. Mm -hmm. And so we would do a couple of tunes a night. And you had a record in four or five days. So it was really relaxed. Yeah. But we, you know, there was a lot of production and interesting things that happened on those records because we had time. And then... Later on, you know, we'd be on the road. He said, well, what do you, 
do you have any dream projects, things you really want to do? And I said, well, I want to do something with an orchestra and, and do something that shows my classical stuff off. And that's why Heart of the Bass happened. Because mm -hmm. the regular GRP label, they didn't want to do it necessarily. And so he had that little division of GRP called Stretch Records. Mm -hmm. And the Heart of the Bass was the first record he did on Stretch. So he was always going out of his way to encourage me. And he, when we were doing some of those electric band records, we'd sit in the lounge and there was another grand piano there and I would be playing some of my compositions and he would say, what are you doing? And I'm saying, well, I'm just trying to write. He goes, yeah, I, I can see that. He said, you really need to have a band and you need to be playing those compositions and you need to record them. And I was like, sounds great. How is it going to happen? Hmm. And he said, leave it to me. I'll take care of it. And he did. How? He got me the record deal with GRP. Right. And but he also the, the band, me. the band part. I mean, well, he just encouraged me. He said, "You have all these tunes. Why don't you put yeah. together a band and, and just play?" There's clubs here that'll have you in LA. And so I did. Mm. And I had some really cool guys in my band. I mean, Alex Acuna played in my early bands on mm -hmm. drums. Tommy Breckline. Uh, the the first band that I had was very interesting. I had some bebop bands too, but when I started doing this stuff towards what I was going to record, I had a band with two keyboard players, John Beasley and David Witham. Great players. Also very heavy jazz guys too. So they were jazz piano players that also played synth. Yeah, they got some great sounds out of those. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and they, I mean... Dave had studied with Jackie Bayard. Mm. Uh, John and I used to play with Freddie Hubbard. And um, so, as did Billy Childs and I. Mm. Um, Chick loved Billy, too. He, Billy was allowed to come to our rehearsals. I remember him coming to our rehearsals and hanging out when we were doing a rehearsal for a record. Chick loved mm -hmm. him. Really, really dug his compositional Mm -hmm. stuff i mean billy was an incredible composer in as a teenager mm -hmm. he was already studying orchestration he went to usc he got his degree as a composer mm. he was heavy already so anyway so there's a lot of experiences i mean we could spend the whole time talking about chick and um and when i got with chick i immediately the first gig i met herbie He said, um, okay, the first thing we're going to do is the Merv Griffin show, TV show, national television, and it's going to be you and me and Herbie and Tommy yep. Breckline. And I was like, What? There's a video of that. There's a shred video of that, too. There's a great really shred. I, I love the shred that also. <laughs> hysterical. <laughs> I saw that. I was on the floor. Anyway, yeah. so here I am. I'm 25 years old, and I'm looking at across, and there's these two guys that, whose pictures I saw on records. I mean, yeah. it was so freaky. And then le that later on led to me meeting Herbie and getting to know him. And later on, we did some playing and over yeah. the years and recording. And in 1986, the second year that I was in the band, because I got the gig in 85, I met Wayne. And by 87, I already played on Phantom Navigator. And then here and there we'd play, because I was still with Chick for many years. Mm -hmm. And then I wound up being with Wayne, and then that band lasted 20 years, and Wayne is like my second dad. Yeah. Let's get to Wayne. Uh, the minute I s started uh, this meeting here, uh, I, I stopped listening to Phantom Navigator, and I love that album. I really love that album so much. So this is the first time you get to play with Wayne, And you play on Forbidden Planet, and you play on Mahogany Bird and Yamanja, those killing songs. But I mean, for, we have to talk about Forbidden Planet, but because it's just incredible. It's it's yeah. And then we wound up doing other arrangements of Forbidden Planet later yes, with orchestra, right? Acoustic, yeah, great. Yes. Now, this is the thing. That record, I remember rehearsing at his house with live yes players, and it was incredible. Terry Lynn. Um, was Jim Beard also there? Yeah, there was different bands on that record. I can't remember. Or Mitch Foreman or... Yeah. 
or I forget. But I didn't play on the whole record, but I remember rehearsing a bunch of the stuff and the production on the record is really strange. It was uh, David Rubinson, his manager, and this producer that they got. And, it, you know, when you heard the music played by live people, it was insane because it was so deep and brilliant. So I, that's the only thing I would say. Right. It's still great, but yeah, yeah, yeah. there's a lot of electronics and stuff that I think it didn't, the production didn't do the music justice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can I can see what you mean, but I, what I what I really want to know is, like we we've, we've talked about the film moment, like you're 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 getting there early, you pick the hardest song. Yeah, yeah. I'd say Forbidden Plan is a pretty hard song. What There's was a, your process of learning that song? I don't remember. It's so long ago. Mm -hmm. It's 1987. Yeah, but I know one thing. I was very serious about playing people's music, and one of the reasons that I became, um, I think, uh, close with composers is they knew that I would take. They could write more freely for the bass, and they knew that I would respect that and learn it. I mean, really learn it. Yeah, not just sort of get through it. And so. I think that's one of the reasons Wayne and I hit it off so much because he knew that I respected his and loved his music and his bass parts are amazing. Yes. Yes. Nobody writes bass lines like that. Wow. And mm -hmm. the stuff on High Life that he wrote. Ooh. Yes. Because um, we started doing like, I remember when we did Children of the Night, the newer arrangement that's from High Life with the acoustic quartet that we had. Yes. So cool. There's one with the NDR Big Band where you guys play this. There's one so up in, up in, in Kiel, Germany, yes. the Jazz yes. Baltica. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, that was a deep experience for us. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was, yeah, that's interesting. The, the very first thing, you know, some of the very first music I had to play you know, but he knew, see, he already, already knew because he, that we had that tour in 86 called the Chick Wayne and Al tour. Al Demiola would open solo guitar and then either Wayne's band would open for us or we had opened for Wayne. And Wayne's band at that point was Tommy Breckline and um, Gary Willis. Right. And either it started off with Tom Canning, but quickly became Mitch Foreman. Right. And Wayne. And they were playing all that music from Atlantis, which had some killer bass parts too. Oh, yes. And so when I got the gig with him a little later, you know, here and there, um, I think part of the reason I got the gig was because I could play the bass parts. <laughs> you know, and I would do it. I would, and I was also a jazz musician. I played upright too. And, but at first it was only electric for me on that gig for years. Mm. until it really became an acoustic situation uh, when we started the quartet, right before that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the quartet. And um, I really want to expand this topic because this is one of the most important bands for me ever. Uh, I mean, uh, so... I, ca I can't really put it into words, but when I first heard you guys, I didn't know anything that you guys were doing. I couldn't understand it, but I loved it. And I loved this feeling of not knowing and floating around. Yeah. Although you guys were playing these songs that I knew, but I've never heard them played like that before. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm wondering, because I've heard... Danilo, you and Brian before in other contexts, before you guys played with Wayne. And I assume that realizing the amount of freedom that you guys unlocked in this band, how how came this realization about? Uh, because at some point, Wayne must have put Sanctuary in front of you, you know, 
uh, Master Foot Foot Press. I don't know. Of course, you know it. The song, but all these songs at Atl Atlantis, you know. But what made you realize? Oh, he actually wants us not to just come for him. You well, know? he would say it. He said, you know, here's the song. But he said, I want to, you know, he he wanted. He really had a con a, a conceptual idea where. He didn't want people to know when we were playing the written music or when we were improvising. He wanted the improvising to sound like compositions. That's yes. why compromising that word came mm -hmm. about. He wanted it. He wanted to start from nothing. That's yeah. what zero gravity meant to him. Start from nothing and compose. And he didn't want us to have to commit always to a certain kind of groove. He wanted this thing to be like time without meter also rubato but grooves without strict meter mm -hmm. so we just kind of ran with it he gave us incredible freedom mm. and he wanted us you know to sort of jump off the cliff without the parachute kind of thing he wanted that kind of reckless and it worked out with us the we were three guys that I mean, I had already been with him for a while, so I knew yeah. I I didn't know this part yet because the other groups that we were playing were it was really electric and I played my six string and the arrangements were, you know, the stuff from Atlantis. So you play all this through composed music and then the blowing was always on one chord. Right. And Terry Lynn was playing and there were these cool grooves and we stretched out and Wayne that was a watershed moment in my life because he, he his solos were so creative and so deep that i felt like a that my solos sounded like a two-year-old and i had been playing with chick and everything i had already mm -hmm. been playing with all these people and all of a sudden he would go ah, da, like two notes and i would be like oh my god i'm mm -hmm. gonna cry i said okay that kind of depth i need i need to dig much deeper spiritually and when i play a note and the sound and the depth of the feeling and the and the rhythmic placement of things it has to be better yeah somehow it has to mean more so i had to not rely on my little bag of tricks you know my language and all my linear stuff i had to learn something else you know mm -hmm. that would take take way more chances and dig deep and also it was so much more interactive yeah we really were composing counterpoint with each other yeah in real time so we had a chemistry though we loved each other we had played on danilo's record before that motherland yeah and so we had something already and it was special and I knew it. I, I remember hearing Brian on a, a, I was already playing with Danilo. I mean, Jack DeJeanette put Danilo and I together. And um, I started recording with him on, I think the first record was Central Avenue that I was mm -hmm. on. And uh, so when he finally told me, because I had heard Brian on a, I think a Joshua record, Joshua Redmond record or something. And I freaked out. I heard him play and I went, oh, my God, I got to find who is this guy? You know, when he said that he had Brian Blade for the record, I was like, oh, perfect. Finally, we're going to play. And it was like, boom, like when we started playing, it was crazy. So the trio. But when they first joined the band, they kept saying, do you think he likes it or what do you mm -hmm. think? And I said, well, I, I can tell you this. He's starting to bring all this music that he never brought before. I never saw this stuff. And he brought Fall and mm -hmm. all this, this music that we never played in the other groups. Wow, you guys played Fall. That's 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 early good, on. We did. Good to hear. We yeah. didn't play it very often. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to. 
He was writing new versions of things. He never wanted to go backwards. Yeah. We tricked him into playing Go, but then we did this whole brand new arrangement with that yes. giant tag that he wrote at the end. Yes. Da, 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 with all these different changes. And so. Um, and Chief yeah. Crazy Horse, you made him. Did you guys make him or did no, he? No, no, he brought he, that. He brought it. He brought that. Go happened because he quoted something that sounded like Go one night. And Brian started going, man, we should play Go. And I remember, um, you know, thinking, okay, well, Danilo and I were scheming. Then we said, well, let's, I got to find the record. Oh, it's on Schizophrenia, I think. So I was in Paris. We were on, on the road in Paris. And I didn't have the record with me. I don't think I owned it yet. Mm -hmm. I had heard it, but, and I remember John Beasley was in, in Paris at the time playing with somebody else. And, and she just so happened that he had the CD with him. So he gave it to me to take and we started transcribing, you know, the, uh, Danilo and I transcribed that intro with the three horns. Oh yeah. Beautiful. Which is beautiful. And we never used it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he didn't want to play that part. So we tried that. But then we got into this whole other thing on that song. Ooh, that's great. I love that version. But I have to tell you about um, Atlantis. Atlantis was the first song. I mean, was the, was one of the songs that I hadn't heard before. So the first time I heard Atlantis was on Footprints Live. Wow. So, and of course, I listened to it repeatedly, repeatedly. and was like, wow. Where, did, where does this, all this come from? It sounds so, as you said before, it sounds so improvised. Yeah. And that was actually the other way around. When I then checked out the original, I, I noticed, shit, Danilo's playing all the written stuff. He's playing all That's these counter melodies. He's doing the orchestra, the orchestration be, be around, but it sounded to me like improvised lines yes. when he played yes. it. And you guys too, you, of course, with the bass lines and everything, you know, that was a song where I was so um, uh, surprised to see how much written material you guys played. Yeah. Yeah. The, the idea was to fool people with that. He didn't want them to know when we were playing. Like, because he would bring in these six page things or four page things and then go, yeah, look, we're just going to play page two. And we were like, really? This is a masterpiece. Mm -hmm. And he would say, no, nah, no, nah, I think. This just this section, we'd be like, oh, I can't believe. Yeah, that that I, there, I have to ask you, what's what about Starry Night? That there has to be more than, I mean, I love everything that is on on the record with Starry Night, but it seems to me that's like a four or five page thing, right? And um, I'd have to listen to the record again to t to tell you what happened because I don't even remember now. Yeah, I but, think the most of what you guys play is that da do da da do da. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And that became other things too. He used that da do da with the you know with that that Wayneish chord where you have like an A flat two over C. Yes, that's a big sound with him. Yes, da -da -da. It's a, another it, another it's one a of those. Portal. Parallel. Yeah, it's very it, important. And it's a portal to something else. Like yes. like an yes. augmented chord can go so many different yeah. ways if you change one note. And the same with this chord. Oh, yeah. And he, wow. The way he uses that chord. It's incredible. With, and that's, with, that's a whole long progression. Yes. In the original. And that, that became something else, too. That was part of, that's in something else too, one of his other songs. Mm. That that thing with those kind of chords. With Danilo, I talked about uh, how he learned Joyrider. And uh, I want to know from you how you learned that song. Because, I learned it, you, I was playing it before? before in the other group. Yeah. And we played, it's a two voice canon. Yeah. And, um, My original part was getting chewed up so much that finally I put it on finale so that I could travel with that part. Yeah. And, you know, but that's all it is. It's incredible. So that when we improvised off of it, we were improvising off those lines. Mm -hmm. 
So it wasn't like, oh, yeah, now we're going to play the changes. I mean, there's implications, and Danilo found all kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing, too, is unless you're close with Wayne, you know, and I, I've been with him longer than those other two guys even, Brian and Danilo, you really can't know how much Danilo really assimilated Wayne's whole harmonic language. Mm -hmm. There's only a couple of people, really. There's Herbie and him. Mm -hmm. And Zabinul, really, huh? Yeah. Yeah, but Zabinul, even different because he he had his thing. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. But Herbie and, and, and Danilo really, and, they, you know, they have their thing too, but they really understood deeply. They went in there, mm. you know, uh, in a way that, how how long was Weather Report together? Fifteen years, I think. Yeah. Well, there you go. Danilo was in we twenty years the quartet. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. Herbie's been dealing with that harmonic language with Wayne since the sixties. So, um, that's what I mean by that. Yeah. Just the amount of time spent in that harmonic world. I've spent more time in that harmonic world than any other bass player. Yeah. And it changed my life. As a composer and an arranger and an orchestration person, too. Mm. Yeah, because it's audible he, in your music. He really supported me in my orchestrations and my outside things and commissions that I was doing and classical crossover stuff. Would you send him things and ask for advice? No, no, it wasn't like that. It was just more like from me playing his stuff and looking at his stuff for so long and marveling at it. Mm -hmm. Danilo and I really studied. We went in on that stuff. Yeah. Can you tell me about it? What happens when you guys study yeah, the music? Well, yeah, I can tell you. I don't know if he spoke about this with you. I wonder if you can hear the piano from here. Go ahead, man. Let's try I'll it. Turn up. I'll turn up. This is something we wound up calling it the four tonic system. Mm. You know, so here, here's another chord that Wayne uses, you know, the 13 flat nine, right? Mm -hmm. you know, those kind of... Like the version of uh, Juju, mm -hmm. you know. So, 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 this is interesting because that's a very diminished thing in many ways. But he doesn't play um, the kind of you know. Everybody goes, you know, yeah. the half step. He doesn't do that. He plays major and minor triads in sixths and all this stuff based on the diminished scale so so he plays all these diminished ideas with major and minor triads yeah I'll show you what i mean so he's it's a c13 with a flat nine he's playing c major and c minor triad e flat major and minor, mm -hmm. F sharp major and minor, and A major and minor. Right. So like, he's going up. That kind of thing, you know. Uh, yeah. You know, that kind of... is four places kind of like you know right all, parking on all four of the of the uh, and that you know so he would go boy you know all these vaulting intervallic things yeah instead of scales and so you know when i first started playing with him even before danilo got there 
I was always freaking out. I was like, what the heck is he doing over these changes? Yeah. How come it sounds so magical and mystical? And there's no scales. Yeah. I mean, it's more so, lyrical than scales. Yeah. And, and I started going, well, I need that. What is that? And then we would sit and work on all that stuff in the sound checks. Sound checks became, I, I'm, I don't know if Danilo mentioned that, but that was a huge laboratory for us. Yes, he did. But I want to get your perspective. So feel free. So, so for me, the interesting thing was not only these things, like putting them on the base. So Danilo was working on all this stuff. So he would come in with all these things. He would have classical pieces. He would have things that he was working on. And then, you know, this kind of combining of, of sounds, combining triads and things mm. on the bass, you know, it's kind of crazy because it, to, to get her, to move around the instrument, like, so that sound, Yeah. I've always been sort of an angular. I love angular things, but this was. Yeah. Ah, uh, that's that's not in the sound, but. Yeah. That's in the sound. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. Oh, so, you know. Uh... Mm. John, when you play something like this, do you visualize it on on the piano? Because it sounds yeah. very pianistic. Yeah, I I took it from piano, but it's it, it's you know after many years like like i would sit there in the sound checks with him whatever he was working on it didn't matter if it went like crazy because you know obviously he on the piano you just do this i have to jump yes i jump just to connect a few of these triads so then it started to my concept for the fingerboard for everything whether i'm playing over just tunes with changes is I, I hear and know the sound from the bottom note to the top in every sound. Mm. I see the fingerboard light up in whatever sound I'm dealing with. Yeah. So in this case, I'm I'm seeing all the the permutations of the, you know, I'm thinking the A triad, the A flat triad, the F sharp triad, the E, e flat, and how do I connect them? Yeah. Yeah. Interval with wide interval skips and stuff. That's my thing that I love, mm. you know. So that's what happened, you know, and Danilo would be practicing all these things and I would just by ear join him. Yeah. And it really, you know, it stretched me. I, I was always trying to veer off and try to find ways to have more of uh, an interesting lyrical thing on the bass. Mm -hmm. You know, because then, then you could go. That's combining. That's still that sound. Yeah. But there's infinite possibilities with that. Right. I just found a couple more. You know, I, I, yeah. I, you know, I don't, <laughs> I don't, um, I don't and, I, and I wrote a bunch of etudes for my students, forcing them to get away from just knowing the instrument step by step. Right. That's the beginning of it. Yeah. You can't learn the fingerboard without being able to hear, okay, the next note is this 
in this chain. Mm -hmm. But I don't like the idea of, you know, and Danilo and I talk about it a lot, the Western concept of scales and, you know, chord scales and everything is like based on running scales and yeah. people sound horrible when they do that. Yes. And the great masters don't do that. They don't sound like that. No. No. So I don't play like that. <laughs> I, I don't want to play like that. You know, this sounds more magical to me. It's more yes. interesting. Yes, I practiced my scales like crazy because when I went to college, you know, I all of a sudden had to be a classical bass major. Mm. So with the scales, with the bow and all the stuff, all that. And I still use the bow a lot. I was shedding today. I was mm. working on some Shoros by... Uh, this one is Dominguinos. Do you want to play it? No, <laughs> I work on it. Uh, you know, but it, it it's tricky. But I am working on it. Yeah, Great. yeah, yeah. Th there there are a lot of jumps also in those shows, right? Yes, yes. And I worked it out. I found how to do it so that it it makes sense. Mm to use the stronger sounding parts of the bass, you know, mm -hmm. while dealing with it, you know. I could really relate to uh, those, those uh, finding those tries within the um, uh, diminished scale. That's yeah. how uh, when I first uh, got into that scale, I had no idea of and I was, all I was doing was play that scale and ever whenever there was a diminished chord in that sheet, right, I would play right. the notes of the diminished chord, which sounded fine, but I was scared. I was scared of it. Me too. But the thing, what really, and I can so relate to this, uh, what really helped me to, to, within the unfamiliar, find the familiar, because the those triads, we know those triads, but do we really see them within the scale so they are, are apparent to yeah. us, like yeah, yeah, yeah. almost like a cutout? Like they jump at us, it's the A major and C, yeah, and, yeah. you know, C a half note, uh, whole note, you know. Um, that was something that I really, that was an eye opening thing for me and to see you guys also, you know, looked at it that way is so very cool to, yeah, to hear. It, it, um, because we heard him doing it. Yeah. Like all of a sudden you go, Boro, ah. Mm -hmm. Like he, it was like, whoa, what's happening? You know, it's like yes. a movie, you know. But once you Very start cinematic. doing this, then on the, the other chords, the chords that you think you know, the yes. ones from before, it becomes yeah. also there. It becomes more lyrical. Yes. It becomes more yes. strong. I, I, you know, and I, I had an advantage having a my brother, you know, he was learning changes. He showed me the chord forms. When I was a little kid on my electric bass, I could play all the arpeggios of a lot of the sounds I already knew. So um, that helped me when I went to this, be more organized and, you know, learning, you know, the sounds of chords up and down the whole instrument, you know, and um, thinking bigger and wider than just, oh, here's my little bebop lick over a D minor seven. Right, know? right. I always, te I always do this for my students. I say, okay, C major. Yeah. If if you follow this thing like I'm saying, then C major is also So it's mm. it's C major, but it's a global C major, not <laughs> yeah. no. 
You know, yeah. it's not that. It's like, do you really know where all of C major is on the instrument? Yes. That's where you great. make it sound like it's not even C major anymore. Mm -hmm. but all the notes, I didn't play one chromatic note in any of that. So then when you add the chromatics. throwing in other things too but yeah it's still it's still you know i'm thinking about coming back home to c major mm. so that's a different approach uh then i i had to kind of really it was a good thing that i studied classically in terms of getting free of of certain things because i didn't want to um I didn't want the bass to tell me what I was going to play. Yeah, that's great. And that's hard because it's mm -hmm. such a physical thing, you know. On this bass, my, Chris Paler, you know, also made it possible for me to get some of my instruments. I'm paying for this on time. This was Art Davis's bass. It's a Galliano, oh, wow. an Italian bass. And he played it on Africa Brass with Train. This bass... Uh, this bass. Wow. Yeah. It's a killing bass. Check this out with the bow. It's it's got a real thing, you know. It's a beautiful instrument, you know. extension put on but I oh I don't see it oh yeah it's all well you'll hear it in a second so if, if you go here let's just open it up where does it go does it go to the C or it will be all natural to, all the way to the C so you hear the voice of the instrument the instrument has a thing yeah w one of my favorite albums is uh, directions in music by Herbie oh yeah and I'm we, we haven't talked about Herbie so much now, but he's he's my biggest hero. And um, I'm, I'm curious about two things. But let's start with uh, um, the rehearsal process to that music, how you guys put that music together. We got with... together. Yeah, we got together with Michael and um, Brian and I and uh, Roy Hargrove. And we went out to... Santa Cruz, we rehearsed in a studio and we played at Quimba Jazz Center, that little jazz club. Brian and I mini disked everything from that tour. We have all these mini discs. Wow. And actually, some of the performances are even better than the record, I think. But of course, we did it at Massey Hall, which is the same place that Bird did his thing. So, oh, of course, he yeah. wanted to use the one from Massey Hall which was great too, but I got to say, there were some other nights that were I, ridiculous. I have a few bootlegs from that tour, and I, I, there, were, there are so many great things that happened there, and <laughs> man. Michael playing solo Naima is... Oh, yeah. Crazy. But you know, what killed me was Herbie, just magic, crazy, unbelievable improvisational genius. Yeah. And, and the fact that he redid the arrangement on Sorcerer and yes. added these things and 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 never, you know, he was so free, but he was always there when we had to do the dun, 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 like the yes. hits. Always. He's one of the most insane coppers I've ever been around in my life. 
Yeah, tell me about it. How does it base, feel? Yeah, for a bass player, um, for a bass player, no one is better than that as a comper. I and mean, why? I think he's kind of the all star. He might be the heavyweight champion of comping. It's hard. I mean, you know, I play with some. They're yeah, all yeah, great, yeah. but he could because he leads and he follows at the same time. Mm. There's no place you can go that he can't come with you and he'll feed you mm -hmm. and i just i'm a huge fan yeah and we got along great you know uh, recently brian and i at the, at the chick korea tribute that i was musical director of at jazz at lincoln center yeah we played two nights and we got to play trio with him i would a have loved to huge see huge highlight we played and i got him to do eternal child Wow. Chick's tune. And also we played Maiden Voyage and it was just like flying yep. in the air. Just insane. Um, that guy. Did, did he ever talk to you it. about uh, his harmonic concept or like? Well, how he... I mean, he helped me like he if you asked him a question, he'd show you what he did. He decides to do an arrangement of so what? in which there are no straight minor chords. So he's at the piano playing his thing and Brecker and I are like, what are you doing? What is that? And he said, oh, it's just this. So he showed us the voicing. So he's doing this, he's playing. So that's a B flat major with a sharp five. Yes. And then a B flat minor major seven, and then the same thing on from A flat. So it goes. And then. Yeah. Yeah. And then. Yeah. <laughs> so a, yeah. Mm -hmm. or, you know, yeah, you know, that's insane. That's cool. When I when I transcribed that song, I I thought it would be like the B flat major sharp five and then the D flat major sharp five, you know, up a minor third. But it's it's almost the same. And but his what what he showed you has more of a voice leading thing built in yeah well that's what he played too like yeah. a lot so but he was playing it and brecker and i were like what you know so there was one tune i'll just tell you this before we go that there was a tune called the poet that the ballad yes. that, when that came in roy brought it in it was nothing like it ended up it was a nice melody herbie reharmonized the whole thing right in front of us wow and he started going, oh, wait, I could, you know, and Brecker and I were calling out what he was doing so he wouldn't have to stop. So oh, that's a C, you know, it's a C7 with a sharp nine, sharp five, or uh, C13 flat nine over this and blah, blah, blah. And we were just, it was like ear training. We were sending them back to each other and scribbling them down so Herbie could just keep going. And at one point in the middle of it, Herbie looked up and he goes, oh, Roy, I'm so sorry. I'm changing your whole song. And Roy was like, no, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> master beautiful. of harmony, master of innovation, master of rhythmic, floating, killing. Just, I can't say enough. I know you want to ask about my music. I, I hope um, we can talk about that new record I did with Chris Potter and Brian Blade. Oh, yeah, of course. The live trio record, because that's mm -hmm. my first live recording. Yeah. Yeah. I really like it, man. It's it's a beautiful record, and I've I've heard you guys in other contexts, and he's on. I mean, the trio is apparent on the uh, the line by line record. Line by line, yes. Yeah, but not a, in a trio format like that. That's know? with uh, Adam Rogers playing guitar. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that was a fun record too. But yeah, um, having them in the trio thing is wide open too, which I love for mm -hmm. my music. 
I've been doing that for a long time now. Yeah. Bass, saxophone, and drums, because for the bass instrument, it's great because you have all this area that you have space. If you want to leave a lot of room, you can. If you like the, with the six string, sometimes I can play chords, mm -hmm. and it's a different sound than you usually hear. So, how would you? I mean, I really love the Remembrance album as well. You know, that's one yeah, of my yeah, favorites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> and I'd say both saxophonists unlock different things within uh, Brian and yourself. Oh, yeah. I, I would like to get your perspective on that. Well, um, let's see. I mean, Joe is Joe. Joe's amazing at what he does. He has a a great sound, great history, great grasp of a lot of things. Um, it's hard, you know, to de describe because then it makes it sounds like you're you're like sort of evaluating them against each other, which I don't want to do. We, no, no, uh, we both know that th these are world class musicians and yeah. um, but I, I, I'm always fascinated by the fact like you have a rhythm section, you have a bass and drums and somebody else comes in and it may be Wayne Shorter, it may be uh, Chris Potter, yeah, yeah. it may be Joe Lovano yeah. and you guys have your thing, but every new guy that comes in will unlock a certain different it's, it's a human yeah. thing it's a human thing if you, we, we if can't you allow it. if you allow it and you're sensitive to it you will react and you will have a vocabulary or a a um a whole range of things with each person yeah now chris i've been hiring i've been playing with chris way longer than i've been playing with joe i started hiring chris because mike brecker like in the 90s, early 90s, I, I brought him out on the road, I think 93, mm -hmm. something like that, with my band, 92 or 93, because uh, I asked Mike, I, I need a tenor player, and I couldn't get Mike, he was too busy, and he wasn't really doing sidemen things so much, so uh, he said, get Chris, and so we've been playing a long time, and I found that, you know, they both interpret my music beautifully, um so it's apples and oranges kind yeah. of but but uh i think for um for the widest i mean for, uh, such a wide range chris has yeah he goes into the electric thing also mm -hmm. um Joe, man, I mean, the, the playing with Joe and Brian has been amazing. We did some stuff in New York. W one of the greatest weeks I ever had as a band leader at Dizzy's at Jazz at Lincoln Center many years ago. when You guys played the Freedom Suite, right? You played something from the Freedom all Suite. All kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, we played all kind of And I, I, yeah. was always, I also played that with Chris quite a bit with Brian. Ah. Yeah. I haven't heard that. Yeah. Well, it was live, you know, live gigs all around. Mm -hmm. different places for a while i was doing that and i even did uh there were some trio tours we did with chris with adam cruz or antonio sanchez mm. when, you know because brian again brian is everybody's trying to grab brian <laughs> <laughs> come play with me so um yeah so i would say in trio the two main saxophonists that play with me are Chris has done more gigs than anybody mm. with that trio format. And then of course, Joe is amazing um, as well. I also play with another nice tenor player. I love John Ellis. Yeah. Very good player. He did some trio stuff with me as well. And Marcus Gilmore, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, that was fun. So yeah, the trio is a, now for many years has been a recurring theme with me also because i play with so many high powered piano players i felt like in my band i needed to have a another sound so i've used guitar a lot and no chordal yeah because i have these you know very tight associations with these pianists for years and um you know and now danilo and i are you know we've been doing stuff for years and we're also talking about maybe doing a duo project mm, beautiful yeah 
like when you talk about that open aspect of trio without a chord in chordal instrument, I was wondering about uh, some of the songs on Remembrance or even also on the on the other one, the new one. Um, do you compose them on the piano or is there some aspect where you also write songs without away from the instrument? Because it, dep is... it depends on the song. You have to tell right. me what. Well, um, I've I've learned today. I, I tried to learn Joe Hen. Oh yeah, and um, that was on the piano. That was on the piano. Interesting, because yeah. Joe Hen and Blues for Freddie also, they they uh, and other pieces they have. There's a sense of liberty in the melody. Yes, and I'm very interested in that because it doesn't seem to be like the melody feels like it has its own will and wants to go unexpected yeah. places. Yes. Um, I want to talk to you about that. Uh, what, what, what's your perspective on that? And, and how did you develop that? Well, I can tell you, I remember writing Joe Henderson. I was teaching at City College for about 10 years in Harlem. Uh, that was the beginning of really my, my uh, regular um, college kind of teaching. Before that, I didn't really do much of that. I did master classes and everything. So now I've been teaching at universities for like, I don't know, over 20 years. Yeah. So I spent almost 10 years at City College. So uh, what I would do is I would drive in early because it's not far from my house. It takes me like 15, 20 minutes to get to Harlem. So I would go in early to get a parking place on St. Nicholas Terrace near City College, which is around, you know, around 145th and 135th and, uh, uh, near Broadway, up in Harlem. Mm. So I had a piano in my room there. And I would just sit and uh, play sometimes. Or I forget I was where I was. I Did I have a piano in my room? It was so long ago now. I think I had a piano in my room, yeah. Mm. So I would, I would play. And um, that I was kind of working on. I, I wanted to have like... I, I just had the idea of a minor blues with some other changes. Yes. We have to talk that, about these other changes. Yeah, yeah. I, I have the sheet. Let me um Yeah, this is the most correct chart for what we've been doing. Uh the end, the last two bars. Yeah. We changed after a while. Yes. Yeah. Gong ging, gong ging, yeah. Okay, so I can pull it up here. We could even put it in Actually, on the screen. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that ending changed. The rhythm changed over the years, and even even since this, maybe it's one gong ging, gong two, three, four. That G flat major seven plus eleven might might come actually on beat two. To gong ging, gong gong. Yeah. Gong, ding, gong, gong. So it could be also went down, ding, gong, gong. But I like gong, ding, gong, gong. Yeah. Gong. I think on the on the album you, uh, you played ding, dong, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, and then sometimes in the blowing you would add those other notes. Like I think for the for the melody it was F D flat G flat, and then for the blowing it was F A flat D flat G flat. Yeah, yeah. So there was different iterations of the how that ending went. That's cool, man. Yeah, basically it's very, very beboppy in a way that, you know, you have those deceptive cadences. Like, you know, uh, what's a little different than normal is having the A flat minor, D flat seven go back to F minor. Yes. In a yes. Way. I, w I wanted to ask you exactly about those chords, how you think about them, and how they came to you. I don't know. Uh, I was thinking like of Joe and Joe and Chick are kind of interesting in the way they do those little two fives. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but you notice I did the, uh, I just like the sound of that going up a minor third. That's yes. very Herbie too, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, those were the inspirations for that kind of move. And then the B minor E7, I think is a little bit more, um, That that's kind of interesting and more tritony, you know, kind of the going from the E seven to the B flat minor. That's a little different. Yes. Also, but it works. 
And the structure of the melody exactly in that moment reminds me a bit of Isotope somehow. The, the yeah, vibe yeah, yeah. It. It's very Johanny. <laughs> even that. Yeah. This part, like, that's yeah. Johan too, like having the, you think it's going to go back to B flat minor there. Yes. But in a way, G has it to does. Very, it does in a way. Yeah, yeah. So um, just to give a minor 2-5 back to the, the tonic. So that's the kind of rationale, I guess. Very piano-oriented when I write these kind of things. I, mm. I, wrote it, I wrote it at the piano. What also struck me is like what you said yesterday about grouping, when you read something. Yes. I can see this in your compositions as well, that you group maybe unconsciously or sometimes yes, consciously. Yes. And then those are those are nice little groups. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they yeah. they can they can be a voicing, they can be a structure that that would stand on its own, but you put it on top of something, and that I think creates the that sense of liberty. And you notice it is basically an extension of the first bar, the way the intervals. Hmm. There, there, um, there's a, a second and then it comes down a third. In this case, I changed it to fit the, the B minor seven. It had to be a little different. I came down a fourth. Yeah. Um, and then I oh, did yeah. a similar thing. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. And these are these kind of things that I do a lot of times, it's just intuitive. And then I realize what I've done. Yeah. My mind works in a certain ordering selection now after being around all these composers all these years and listening to classical music too of course but also what i'm in, uh, i'm interested is in uh, is uh, you have a sheet now you put this in front of people and then i start noticing which of i mean it's obvious that that you would want to do this but you change the chords when you when you go for the blowing um there, I, I can hear different changes each chorus. Yeah, minor you. blues, like it changes to a regular minor blues. You know, it's very fluid at that point. It can go anywhere. Yeah. And that was a, a little bit a hard part for me when I was trying to learn the song. I could never figure out, is it A flat minor seven and then D flat minor seven or D seven? I could, you know, the way you yeah, yeah. played the, the, um, the second bar, I think was more this type of harmony within the within the uh the melody when you played the melody yes. right yes yeah. and then it was much freer exactly it could exactly. be a regular minor blues at that point yeah but with well, a player like joe you you have somebody who can react to harmonic choice like that on the spot you know uh fluently yeah and his stuff is really f free as is chris i mean they both have complete freedom harmonically yeah. How did you work on being able to follow uh, somebody like that, like a, like a horn player, Flo follow their harmonies or wh what they might be thinking or, you know, uh, how did you work on that? I think I was influenced heavily by Ron Carter, the way, what he did with Miles. And, um, you know, he... I remember talking to Jerry Allen about this when she was she was an amazing musician. Um, oh, yeah. And um, she always said, you know, people always talked about how Scotty LaFaro broke up the time with Bill Evans, but Ron had his own way of breaking up the time. And also, I would add to that, Jimmy Garrison mm. also broke up the time in amazing ways and followed the saxophone or 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 commented or made suggestions of his, of their own to the to the soloist and the comper yeah so when you take the comper away you know you know usually people don't really hear down that low very easily like where we are where we live as bass players so when you take away the piano which is an orchestra and takes up a lot of bandwidth you know um in terms of frequencies when you take that away you have a lot of room and i think the soloist can hear the bass better so um, it gives them an opportunity to hear down that low and hear what you're doing. Ron, architect of doom, he 
was the greatest, is the greatest architect uh, of walking that I've ever heard. Yeah. I mean, if you get together with somebody like Ron, which I think you have. Um, we, we've talked and, and we've become friends over the years. And, you know, I've always expressed to him, he was, you know, when I was first starting to hear jazz, he and Ray Brown were huge influences. But I think as time went on, his influence was even more pervasive because he moved into modern music and how you play bass, starting with Miles. I, you know, I heard him play with on, on those records with, you know, Wes Montgomery and all these things. Mm -hmm. But when he played with Miles, they opened up another window about how to play modern, how to play over the form of tunes, standards, but then stretch like to the moon and then beyond with Miles when you have tunes that are wide open like Dolores oh, yeah. or, um, you know, on Miles Smiles, all that stuff they're playing, all the Wayne compositions that, you know, you know, orbits and all. It's incredible what they do. Yeah. And really the biggest compliment we ever got in Wayne's band was, you know, that those guys, you know, felt connected to that. Like they, I think they realized that they inspired us. Herbie yeah. used to come to see us all the time. He said, boy, you guys are extending now where we left off when we stopped playing. And that to us was the highest compliment and the most meaningful thing anybody could say about what we were doing, really. Yeah. So that's how I feel about Ron. I feel like his architecture and how he pointed towards the future and then fulfilled the future. Um, he was very important in the development of how to do that and break up the time in a different way from the bottom up as opposed to the top down. Mm. Can you explain as, that? That's interesting. Gary, I always tell my students to think about it that way. A lot of times when they think about breaking up the time, they think of Scott LaFaro or a European approach, ECM-ish, which sometimes is top down. The bass players are playing in the middle register and higher mm. when they break it up. They're playing, whereas Ron would pivot from low notes. He'd have things ringing and then play up there, but there would be something, the bottom never went away. Yeah. Garrison, bottom mm. up, bottom up. I do a lot of that even though I use the whole instrument. I like the idea as a composer and an orchestrator to have not a band in the bottom. Yeah. In a group. I always keep it going somehow. I don't stay up too long, ever. Mm -hmm. That's true. Because yeah. I'm still a foundational player. When I solo, yeah, I, I do whatever is necessary, but I um, when I'm accompanying... I feel like there's a lot of ways you can break it up, not just the Bill Evans trio way, which mm -hmm. is incredible. I mean, it's beautiful. Yeah. I saw the Bill Evans trio with Eddie Gomez when I was a kid. Oh, wow. Yeah. In San Francisco. Any Amazing. remembrances from that? Any memories? Yeah. I, I remember I was about 16, 17 years old and heard Eddie Gomez playing all like incredible in the upper register like that. And, and I had heard George Moraz do it too. But with Bill Evans, it was a different thing because it was way, you know, the, the interplay, the three-way dialogue was pretty amazing. And Eddie was in rare form. It was like 1977 or, you know, mm. 76. He was killing. And um, I'll never forget that because that made me, that inspired me to get my high register playing together some mm. position um and to really work on that how did you work on it oh man well i studied classically but i also made exercises for myself where i would start there right there and then just play all my sounds like from one note i'll show you yeah i always do this with my students if i'm so i start from the e so there's those those four harmonics, and you can call out any call out any major or minor kind of chord or any any kind of chord you want. Just name one. Oh, G minor. G minor. So um, we'll start with the the just generic Dorian one and go. Or 
melodic minor. Oh, uh, G minor, yeah. Yeah. The first one. Yeah, that's the first one. I don't know if I did it right the first time. I was thinking of something. That's the, the, the uh, Dorian here's. Yeah, so so I, everything comes from from there as a base, and then like um, then uh, uh, like a right. I gotta warm up. You know, yeah. whatever sound could be D flat minor. You know, and I practice going up these strings, going straight across, right? Whatever it is, so that I know where things are. Great. What does your ear do in this moment? It um, it has to adjust to that other sound. The ear is guiding me still. Because it it shows me well. Is this a half step I need here, or a whole step, or what is this anyway? You know. Mm. things are because I sat there for hours <laughs> yeah. was you there know. something that Chris Polar uh, helped you uh, uh, he, no a lot of the stuff that was that came much later I see yeah I, I mean my, my getting into that he helped me he was my foundational guy and also always learning stuff from him about writing and stuff mm. but technically I went on my own path after I started studying classically and then I just I jumped into all these other ideas because I was, you know, needing to pursue certain directions on my instrument and I needed the freedom to do that. Mm. So I, I took a very uh, global approach to the instrument. I said, well, I have to be able to play through different sounds all, all the way around, you know, no matter what. Yeah. I mean... Um... You're very uh, well known also for switching instruments, and uh, both of them sound uh, incredible on on the I mean insane high level, uh, and that's something that's very rare. With usually you would you would think of somebody who plays one thing greatly, <laughs> and then the other one is something like a a maybe, double, yeah, yeah a double. exactly, and yeah. that's not what you are, and. Um, I have to say, sometimes I feel, um, I I think it's a high pressure situation. If sometimes I have to play the grand piano and the Rhodes on the same gig, because to right, me those right, right. are two different worlds, two different animals, and both of them require different kind of mechanics and and physics. Um, so I sometimes have trouble, you know, changing within a concert or a sure. record session. But you don't seem to have that problem at all. <laughs> And I well, want to talk to I, you about I, that. I, I, I um, internally have to deal with it. Mm. Like I just picked up that bass right now and I hadn't played it all today. So it's really physical, the acoustic bass. Whereas if I pick up my electric bass, it's like a race car. Like there's no physical usually compared to that. Yeah. So I have to adjust in my head. Also, it took me some years to figure out how to not um, overplay the electric, like pl play too hard, because I was so used to the pressure level needed here. Mm. Also, I added another crazy thing into it. I, you know, I've always played with the bow since college. Even in high school, I started playing with the bow. 
But then I really kept working at it. So, you know, I was sitting there working on that Choro again last night and, you know, so that that's a process. Like I'll show you a little bit of the process with that. Mm -hmm. So this is a Choro written by um, Dominguinos. So it's written, you know, it's not written for the bass. So the good thing about it is it, it challenges you in many ways, but it also, you've got to um, work with the octave displacement to make it right. So... Uh... Bass, as you can see, this like this part. Uh, this part. <laughs> virtuosic etude kind of like you know so if you do it really slowly which is what I was doing a lot then I decided it needed to be slurred here this is hard Because it's really should be. Yeah. I, I haven't gotten it yet. You know, that's kind of crazy. Oh, man. Thanks for sharing that. That's, that's the process. Like, I yeah. have to go very slowly for a very long time. Yeah. And what's, what's your mindset when you practice? Because it looks the same. You, you look the same like you when you would play on stage and of course you are working on something but it sounds so great like it sounds on stage you know so I'm, what's your... I'm working on yeah I'm always thinking about rhythm and sound so I had it down at like you know 70 beats per minute you know and playing the 16th notes it's like 8th notes yeah you know really slow to figure out Because because I did that, I'm not far from playing at a tempo already. Mm -hmm. 
but I'm still there's a divide there because as you can see it it takes me all over the base so you know it's yeah. it's work it's a few octaves to deal with mm. whereas if I was playing on electric bass it would just all kind of lay I mean it's not 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 easy on electric either cuz you still got to negotiate all those arpeggios mm. and sounds. Could you talk about what is there something that you've learned about the double bass the acoustic from playing the electric and vice versa? Like, oh yeah. Yeah. What, There's what definitely a cross pollination. Um it informs the way I played certain kind of grooves on the acoustic bass being able to play grooves that are thick and you know coming from african and latin bass lines african cuban bass lines or funk like being able to do that on the acoustic it's a cool sound on the acoustic but it i was definitely informed because i started on this on electric so and by uh, vice versa i heard what made me learn how to walk i you know when i was learning how to walk i only had an electric bass for years and so I had to make it feel like the other one. Then when I started playing this one, it informed my electric bass playing so that I could swing uh, more on the electric, which is, mm. it's more work. It's another kind of work to get what? it to bounce and do that. And why is that? It's a, a completely different instrument. Mm. It doesn't have the same physicality. The bigger instrument, you know, when you do little those little skips and tick -tick 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 and all those, it's just so easy on the acoustic. Mm -hmm. For me, I mean, it just feels so natural. Yeah. But to make it, to tuck in those, like I'm always telling my students, when you have a tick -tick 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 on an electric, you have to tuck that note in. Yeah. The downbeat is the thing that gets the emphasis, not the little triplet lick. Yeah. If you emphasize the triplet lick, like a lot of electric bass players do, it sounds terrible. And you lose the downbeat. Yeah, the you lose the downbeat the and the swing never happens. It's just like, pick at the boom. You know, it's like, what? Mm. That's not the, that's not what we're accenting. We're going to, to boom, boom. Like mm -hmm. where those little things that are triplet licks, they're always heading to a downbeat or coming from one. They are not the, the place, the landing point. They're mm -hmm. pointing towards a landing point or bouncing off a landing point, mm. but they're not the focus. Your song "Forgotten but Not Gone" is is a great example. Yeah, of that. yeah, I mean, yeah. That, it's, that's a good it's one built that. in. Yeah, yeah. That's very Ronish, you know. That's extremely Ronish, you know. Uh, Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's two two keys at once. Yes. So this kind of stuff. Uh... money <laughs> but um the idea is that you know your time has to really be strong for that and i remember you know when i was younger i was trying to get all those things together and it was a young drummer that i played with named mike i forget mike's name but he was uh, out in california and he hadn't heard me in a while and he and we played together or he came and heard me somewhere and he goes you know it sounds like you really started, you worked on the, the st your time is much more happening when you're doing your triplets. What did you do? You know, and I, I, he, I said, well, thanks for noticing. I've been really trying to, because, you know, I always joke with my students when, if you don't land well, it's kind of like the kid who's up on a diving board at a big swimming pool and says, watch me, watch me to his parents. 
or he, he or she, and then they dive and they do a big belly flop and they land like, <laughs> like really bad. That's what that's like. You know, you go check me out, dig -a -dig -a -dig -a -dig, you know, oh, and yeah. if you don't land well, it's bad news. <laughs> exactly. For everyone. <laughs> But the yeah. but the open strings come in strings come in handy for that thing. But well, if they if they the ring thing. too much, yeah, you, you can't do it. Yeah, and that's what the electric bass players are not used to doing a lot of times because they're used to playing everything closed. Mm -hmm. They don't use the um, except the older guys, the pioneers did. James Jamerson used them all the time because he was an acoustic bass player first. Mm. So on those famous Motown records, even if it, if it's in key of D flat, he's using low A's, ghosting all these low open strings that are not in the key mm -hmm. to pivot to get to the notes he's trying to get to. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. Um, we talked a lot about the, the older guys like Ron. Um, who were some of the your peers that you've learned uh, where you've learned certain things from you know what did you learn from your peers well i guess if you go start going through the ages right like the the the, the generations obviously you know you know i started off with ron and ray and then of course later on i heard pc and then i went back and i heard blanton and i love oscar pettiford a lot mm. and then you hear you know percy heath and sam jones and all these great players then you know, also, I was hearing Nils Pedersen. I was hearing Dave Holland, Eddie mm. Gomez, George Mraz. Um, uh, still, these guys are all older than me. Uh, and then I heard, uh, who else? Well, I also heard Earl May play with Dizzy Gillespie's small group, and he was playing left-handed electric bass because mm. Dizzy didn't want to travel with the acoustic because it was expensive and kind of a hassle. Did you think about using the left hand basis uh, then when you saw it? No, no, because I was already firmly entrenched in this. I see. I'd have been already, I, I would have had already been playing about five, six years on the electric. And when I was 15, I just started playing acoustic. So that I didn't even entertain trying to do this left handed because then you have to get different instruments. Oh, yeah. you know, it's, it's a mess. So luckily i play righty and left hand does a lot of work so um so yeah um then i heard let's see i'm trying to think of who i heard then the guys after that i also heard steve swallow who i loved um and what's your relationship to jaco I, uh, well, yeah, I didn't even talk about the electric guys. I mean, the electric guys, it's like James Jamerson, Chuck Rainey, um, Jocko Stanley, Anthony Jackson. Mm. And with my peers, because Anthony's sort of a peer, but a little older, Marcus Miller, I love, love Marcus Miller. Yeah. Obviously, Victor Wooten, who's younger than me, uh, he and Steve Bailey are really good friends of mine. And we've played together quite a bit. Also, I, I loved Victor Bailey. He was great. Oh, yeah. Well, I could name a lot of guys. And then on the acoustic bass, um, I met Jay Anderson when I was in my late teens. I moved down to Southern California and I met him. And I liked the way he played a lot. Scott Colley, who's a little younger than me, plays great. Of course, uh, you know, Larry Grenadier is, is is a fine player as well, and also Ben Street, mm. um, Kristen McBride, a powerhouse, very strong. Um, uh, Gerald Cannon is a friend of mine. I like the way he plays mm -hmm. too. Um, I know I'm forgetting a ton of people that are friends of mine. Uh, so this is always a hard thing to do off the top of your head, you of know. Of course. Is there somebody that you, people. where you practice together with somebody, you know, is there like, I'm, I'm I'm curious about these kind of situations. Is there somebody who you would ask, you know, what, what are you checking out? Can you, you know? Um, I mean, Ben Street and I have played a little bit together because we teach up at Berkeley with Danilo sometimes. So we've done duos for the kids and played like from nothing, mm -hmm. just improvised. And that, that's a lot of fun with Ben. We had some really cool stuff that happened. I wish I had it on, you know, I could play it for you, but I don't. Mm. Um, 
uh, Scott Colley and I have done a few little things, but you know, bass players are always working. So there's no, yes. a lot of times it's hard to get together and just practice with someone else. Cause you're always, your, your practice sessions, you're very pointed about what you need to do. Yeah, exactly. Although sometimes there's some really cool stuff I would do with my students with the bow. I would play, you know, I would start on the low E and make them start on a G sharp, play in tense and move up the scale. Oh, nice. Uh, with no vibrato, just like listening and blending. And mm. the times when I, I uh, have played with other bassists is in bass sections for film music. Since I was a young guy, I've always been involved in recording. So, yeah. Um, I did get to play, and since I've been in New York, I've played in the best bass sections I've ever played in in my life. Players from the Philharmonic and the Met, and me, somehow. Mm. Somehow I'm included. <laughs> so, and I learn a lot, because mm. cats who really, that's all they do, uh, I always steal from them and learn ideas and watch them like a hawk, you know. Watch them, that's, that's a good topic. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts on eye contact because yeah well I, i i believe in it also because obviously i was playing with chick for years so we spent decades staring into each other's eyes like <laughs> just playing you know like he was way into that and i like that too i always look around and uh with brian and danilo and wayne's band spent a lot of time looking at brian in my life mm -hmm. and also with danilo um in my own groups with nate smith like the other night we did two nights uh we did a little mini tour of the east coast we were going to do longer stuff but it doesn't work out so we just did there's a club called jimmy's in portsmouth new hampshire which is a newer club which is a beautiful art center that they made up there mm -hmm. big play big club and terrific and then we played at a small place called the jazz gallery in new york city which now is upstairs in a building and it's it's sort of a a non-profit now and um we even recorded mm. like they you know you could pay a little money and they record and film you so eventually i'll probably release some of that stuff too it's pretty cool great yeah the band so what happens to you if somebody's not into uh eye contact is do you miss something or um i think so most of the people i hire are, are uh We'll look around occasionally, at least. Yeah. Yeah. Because it is important, communication. Absolutely. Yeah, and you can But, see something. You can adjust to certain situations if somebody's like going on out on a limb and a yeah. certain look can give you uh, the the affirmation like, I'm cool, don't worry about me. I'm, I'm well, trying well, things yeah. here. And, and also the converse is also true. Once you've been playing with somebody for years, you could all have your eyes closed and you're really tuned in still. Yes. So there's that too. But that's born out of relationship, I think. Yes. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, um, you've just released this great uh, live album. <clears throat> and I think I, I know you were playing for at least two weeks or one one or two weeks or um, something? You... Uh, two and a half weeks, probably. Yeah. yeah. So how many concerts did you record? Uh, they only really recorded three because oh, okay. this guy came out and and one we couldn't use. It was a huge square. It was like a thousand people in a square in Northern Italy. And it just didn't, um, it didn't lend itself to a, a recorded sound. It was cool because he got an idea of what he needed to do. The bulk of the gig, the bulk of the record, like every song except without a song, was done in Gen Genova oh, in one night. It came from, and the first chunk is like like a part of a set. It just unfolded, and we really liked it. And so then, without a song, it was from another gig in Alba. Yeah, it's a beautiful Italy. version. Beautiful. Yeah, that that I. I When I heard that, I said, we have to put that on there. Yeah. Tell me about your, your process of putting together an album. Like, let's take this live album for now. Well, live albums are unusual. It's a different process because, you know, you hopefully have something to choose from. We had a little to choose from, but not a lot. But it didn't matter because the band, you know, those are long-term relationships. And 
and the music. And we've played trio before um, together and also in different formats. We, you know, played for decades with these two guys and different things. Um, so there's a lot of, there's a few new compositions too, like that. Out West. Out West and Three Pieces of Glass are brand new. And there was another one too. There was another little three-part suite that I wrote that we never really played that much on that tour, mm. which was cool. I would like to play that sometime, but we didn't really have time to get into it. Mm -hmm. um, so Out West and also Echoes of Scarlatti, that's basically an improvisation, but it's based on uh, a Scarlatti sonata in D minor that Chick and I used to play. Mm. And then we would open up on it, you know. There's a there's a recording that I hope comes out someday uh, from the 2019 trio tour that we did, which was the best ever. Um, before that tour, Dave Weckel came to me and said, "Look, I'm, you know, when we were younger, I I didn't really bring the right drums and cymbals on the trio, so I'm going to bring the 18 inch." bass drum and this flat rides and really do it up so that tour was incredible uh and chick was on fire and we would do the scarlatti we would do the d minor we would play the we actually played the whole thing mm. but we would open up a section and he would blow and it was incredible scarlatti's music for a lot of reasons is very interesting he has a different groove yeah. he has a different exotic he was from naples he Naples was conquered by many Arab nations. He was also worked under the Queen, so he was also in Portugal, Queen of Spain, I believe. But then also in Portugal, so he had access. I'm sure he heard African musicians. Ah, uh, yeah, because his music, even though it's Baroque like Bach, there's something other. There's another thing going on there. Mm-hmm. And he gets some different colors also, like harmonically. Yes, and I think. He was influenced by that kind of Arabic thing, even though it's not it's not overt. Mm. There's just something about the swing in Scarlatti. And if you're, you know, you, you being a pianist, I would recommend to you, Enrico Pernunzi did a, a recording called Scarlatti. Like he did the Scarlatti sonatas, he played them verbatim, and then he did meditations on each one. Mm. It's totally killing. Oh, well, check it out. I cool. think it's my favorite Enrico Pernunzi mm -hmm. I've ever heard. Does he play this one? I can't hear you when you do that. I don't oh. know why. I think what happens is when you, wait, yeah. If I if I play, you don't hear. It. So da yeah. da do, da 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 da. You know the you that know sounds that one? familiar. In the hey, B minor. He, 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 it could be on there. I have to look yeah. at my CDs. It's an astoundingly great record. Yeah. He really plays his tail off. Man. Oh, cool. I played a little bit with Enrico years ago, but to me, even more than the trio playing, this solo piano stuff, really mm. good. Um, okay, so you, you were chosen from... Um, uh, three concerts from the from the trio from that tour not even only you know we we eliminated the first one because the the big square and everything oh right just, that was part of it. it i see i see okay and then what's your process of finding a good sequence of songs well this this one was unusual it was much easier than usual because the first thing from visa through out west and uh, three pieces of glass. It just happened that way. It all fell out in a in a chunk. And when I brought it back to you know my student John Davis is a great bass player. He was one of my students years ago. He's an incredible engineer and a great bassist. He 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 and his buddies his partners built the Bunker Studios in Brooklyn, and they run it. So that's where we did Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And that's where I did the solo of the bass, my solo bass recording. Yeah. Um, which is not all solo, uh, but uh, so Brooklyn, I, Bro I love, I love the bunker. Mm. So when I, when I got the tapes, you know, they gave me the, 
the you know the guy did a good job of capturing things live brought it to john davis and he mixed the recording and then we mastered it they have a mastering room there too alex de turk great mastering engineer so he said wow that first sequence those tunes they just flow into each other it just it sounds right i think you should leave it alone i said yeah and then uh, we put Molly in there. I can't remember. Mm. And we actually, you know, the intro to Molly, mm -hmm. with the with that with that effect that I had on the bass, where mm -hmm. it octave higher, and then you could play counterpoint with yourself. Mm -hmm. That was from another separate free intro to something. Right. And okay. Put it in front of Molly because I felt like I needed that on the record. That sound had an inspiration to it and it inspires a certain kind of playing and then chris so we had almost like three voices yeah yeah yeah. and i like that so we put it in front of molly it and works so it nailed it in and um and then the scarlatti thing was a tribute that's that's from towards the end of the concert so we used it and then we decided to put alba the uh the without a song because we felt like i don't know there's just something about that version everybody has such reverence for sonny's version and um chris has so much he has so many roots as well as being so modern see to me he's an interesting case because because of his age too he has going back to sonny and stanley turrentine and bird because he mm -hmm. started out on alto yeah. and train, Brecker, Wayne. He has this huge amount of influence and Sonny. And it's really in there. So when he plays that song, it doesn't sound like, even though he's not as young as he once was, he was a child prodigy. It sounds like somebody who's been around for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And and it's interesting in a way. There's a parallel there be, between him and Joe Lovano because when Joe Lovano came up, his father was a tenor player, Tony Big T, who had hung out with all these famous people like Tad Dameron, and I think he had even played a jam session with Train once. So Joe grew up around his father and that big sound. His father had a big sound and all these players. So that John Schofield told me a funny story when he they arrived at. Berkeley College of Music at the same time. Schofield said, Joe sounded like an old pro as a freshman. He sounded like, where's this guy coming from? He mm. sounded like an old dude who'd been on the road for 40 years yeah. already. So they have that old soul thing. And Chris, when he was a teen, an early teen, he was a sensation. And Red Rodney and Iris Sullivan grabbed him when he was a pinhead he was barely he mm -hmm. was already playing like bird and you know like, what so they have old souls both of yeah. them yeah that's true oh yeah you you just mentioned the solo album and there's a song uh my favorite song on that album is seeds of change the second is it the second one yeah the the reprise yeah, with yeah. the drums wait no no i'm talking about um um Oh. Yeah, that's that's seas of change. Yeah, it, I think it's two times on the record, right? It, yeah, it there's a reprise. Back. There's yeah. a reprise of it. Yeah. The first time it's just me. Second time there's drums. I see. Yeah. And it fades in, and then I'm doing these chords and kind yeah. of. Yeah. I was wondering when does the song stop? You know, when does the written thing stop? It has these, this this minor movement, okay. and then the I'll, A. I'll, yeah, I'll I'll give you the lead sheet. Oh man, thank you. And then you can see what was written and what isn't. Yeah, I'm going to share it on the screen. Is that okay for you? Yeah, yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a funny little seven that. You know, and that, that, you know, see, that's the, that's exactly what I was talking about with you yesterday. I didn't know what times I had to count it out myself after I played it. I didn't know what time signature it was. in. Yeah. And then I had to figure out, oh, there's a bar of six. And then 
<laughs> you two yes. bars of six, and then it goes into four and stops the first time, and then the second time it goes into that seven. Yeah. I'm not counting. I'm just going. You know, little things. So that's what. And the other thing where it goes to the E. And then boom, ding, ding, ding. I that six four, it's free rhythm and it changes meter too. I'm yeah. not, I'm not, I'm not um, holding to that six four in that section. Mm -hmm. See, that was the moment where I was uh, curious. Like, is this composed? Is this improvised? And it's exactly yeah. what we talked about yesterday, making something composed sound improvised. You know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Well done. <laughs> you did Thank it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then the booty, do, 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 do. see, it's there. Yeah. So that that's an example of that. Let me, let me see. What's the other one you talked about? Oh yeah. Uh, I would. Uh, yeah. I, I'm curious about now how you wrote down wrote down the harmony, but um, under the under the melody before the, before it goes into the the B flat uh, minor blues. Yeah. Because that's also that was so interesting to me that it starts off with the F tonality, yeah. and then you kind of trick us, yeah. uh, because everybody expects it to be in I don't know in F minor blues. Then you know, yes, yes. that's really cool. It's yeah, I see it. Pedal. I think it goes to the C. So here, here we have it. Yeah, bar f right here at bar six. Yep. It's kind of a C, like a five kind of thing. Interesting, yeah, because you play kind of a tonality. It, to me, it sounded like F minor major seven with a flat 13. Yeah, it is. But from C, from the... I mean, I think I do a pedal. Let me just see. Hold on a second. I haven't played it in a long time. Uh, yeah, when it goes. Yeah. It's like. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's. So it's like, it's actually. It's a C pedal there. Then back to F. Yeah. And it always throws people off because of the way the harmonic, the the way that one one two but ba ba da dee that's yes. ba -dee, da da people get yes. screwed up with that. So it's like da 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 you know then it. And then, then, when, then there's an F pedal on the B section. You know that that. Uh, yeah, that and sound. then you double the melody. Yeah. Then it goes straight to B flat minor. Now, when John Schofield came to my house, I was living in Dobbs Ferry before we moved to this house. I remember sitting in this little room. I was renting a floor. We were renting a floor of a house. We decided, hey, why don't we? Do originally we were going to go right to B flat minor and play, and then each chorus was going to go up a fourth, and we were going to go oh. around like crazy. We didn't do that. We stayed in B flat minor, mm -hmm. but that's a way you could do the tune, and it would sound really cool. So that's that's, that's interesting. That yeah, that's cool. Like uh, uh, just a quick question. Like uh, right now, when you're when I heard you. Uh, walk that um, that what you where you said that the C C pedal and then the, that tonality on top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's something that is sometimes hard for bassists to realize to when they start out playing walking bass lines. Yeah. On how to maintain that feel of where the the 
the strong yeah, yeah. beat is and yeah. where it isn't and yes. it so, so goes together with a harmonic understanding yes um could you talk about that yeah so like if you're playing that you have to make sure that they know like if you slowed it down yeah Sometimes we did it uh, like, uh, oh, we did a two four bar. Yeah, it is a two four mm. bar. Da bit about bay about a did a one two boom. Ah, interesting. Yeah, cool. I think da 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 be da ba da bo be ba da. No, no, it's two bars. Yeah, and I think you leave the F for a while, and then you jump in on the third third bar yeah something but what i was actually referring to is like how do you ground uh, how 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 do you ground harmonically a bass line so it's clear where you where you hear it That's it's simple that. you play the root down low on the downbeat and you really <laughs> like mark yeah. it but see a lot of the students i always give them a hard time about that i said you guys are allergic to roots and downbeats yes you won't play them I got a lot of gigs in my life because I played the form and showed people the form so that it made it easier for them to improvise and stretch. Yeah. You know, the best compliment I ever got always was when people say, man, when you play, I hear the form. It makes it easy for me to play. There you go. That's our job <laughs> as bass players. And, and it's also fun. I like being the bottom and the foundation. Because that's when you see if you're prioritizing rhythm and sound... There's a lot more to playing that root down low than just playing the root down low. It's the sound. Mm -hmm. It's that, you know, like Garrison. Yes. I mean, I, I it took me years to realize how much Garrison affected me because I've been listening to so much Train. And at one point I realized, wow, I really was influenced and stole a lot from Garrison in mm -hmm. terms of my accompaniment playing. Mm. Why wouldn't you? you yeah, know? of course. Yeah. Um, to me, you seem like a very, very positive guy. Uh, and um, there's an energy and a, and a focus there when I see you play, when I talk to you. Um, and I'm wondering how and if you had to deal with self-doubt, like that hindering self-doubt, you know, that there's the... Hit. Of course. Everybody goes like after a gig, ah, I didn't play well, but there's yeah, also yeah, the, yeah. the self-doubt of like, I can't play. I, I am, I'm too yeah. bad, you know. Yeah. Um, I've had did, it. Yeah. yeah. Could, could you talk like, about it? We, we, you know, what they call the imposter syndrome, where you mm -hmm. feel like I'm an imposter. Sure. I, I mean, I have a very deep faith. I'm uh, a Christian, but not a... You know, my brother's a pastor but not the right-wing crazy people that are always on the news in the United States. Um, so, uh, for me, my faith is my grounding, and I've been committed to it since I was about 17. Mm. I really started studying the scriptures and really getting in there, and I've been involved in many churches and... Um, and uh, as a prayer minister, also as a deacon and an elder, I'm an elder now again, which mm -hmm. just means you're old. But uh, <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, being involved in serving people. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that's my grounding. You know, I, I realized that one of the hardest things in the world for people to do is accept love. And spiritually, the hardest thing, even if you if you believe in God and you're committed to Him and all that, is to accept 
the love mm. that comes from God and the whole in my case the Holy Spirit God Jesus all that um, and that's my grounding that's what keeps me sane too because I realize that you know I can't do it in my own strength mm -hmm. it's not me the the talent you know, this is what I believe I'm not trying to push it on anybody but the talent itself came from there mm -hmm. and the DNA and the and the uh, the family of origin and the particular personality that I have came from there. My job was to develop what he gave me. Right. That's a responsibility because mm -hmm. I've known I've seen some people in life who were given tremendous gifts, who I thought way more talented than me on the base, throw it away. Just not pursue it or not work hard and and so. I feel like I've been given so much. I have a responsibility to develop it. Then, you know, but as as a human being, we become usually the drive that makes us want to become great at something. There's definitely insecurity in there as well. Mm -hmm. And then also what happens when you actually are successful and people, you know, expect you every time they hear you to be great. Yes. It's pressure. Yes. Sure it is. But the the thing is, it's only pressure if you buy into the individualistic um, society that has been forged, especially in the United States, where the individual is, that's everything. Mm. So people wall themselves off as individuals and there's no more community, there's no more society because everybody's so separate and now we, we get trapped into these things. Mm -hmm. The Three Pieces of Glass, that song that I wrote on the record was from a book that I wrote by a, by a philo philosophical, theological thinker who said the three pieces of glass that are partly responsible for a lot of good things in the world or part of the destruction of of emotional health in society are the computer screen the phone and the tv right that makes sense and so you know the way we thrive and the way we were made to thrive is in community that's why music is so beautiful that's why it changes people's lives and changes society and it is a force for good in this crazy world because it's born of community you can't have great improvised music without community exactly yeah you can't just be an individual yeah but what, what that's what, the problem what happens if you um if you uh, get insecure about your playing, about you as a person, you become that insular, that, that yes. single... Um, you isolate. Yes. And you're not part of the community. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm always... I do a lot of praying. Um, I do a lot of reading. Um, I know that if I'm not serving people and actively involved in community i can't grow as a person because mm. that's the way we grow only when we are close enough to someone for them to speak into our lives encouragement too not just criticism mm -hmm. but when you're vulnerable with other people they can speak into your life and say man you know i really love you and i you know this really helps me about you or you know and i that's part of my I think I was given a certain kind of calling and a gift to encourage people. Mm -hmm. So even though I'm older, like I'm at a church now where I'm older than the pastors, they're younger than I am. But I call them up because I know my brother's a pastor and I know what it's like for him. Like, you know, you pour out to the people and you're always giving. But a lot of times people don't ever come up to the pastor and go, man, that was really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Or thank you for that food pantry thing that you did last week. To feed all these poor people, they they just sort of assume that you that's your job. You're supposed to be, yeah. You're supposed to be doing that, but they don't encourage their the leader in the situation. So that's um, part of what I feel is important. That's maybe why I'm a teacher. Mm -hmm. I'm tough on my students, but I give them a lot of encouragement too. 
Yeah. Because I'm trying to hold them to a higher standard so that they become all they, they, they reach the potential that they have, mm -hmm. as opposed to having a wonderful gift and then throwing it away. But for some people, it's also hard to realize that they have a gift, you know? Yes. I mean, especially if they've been through a lot of criticism. See, I was I went through a fair amount of criticism when I was growing up. My parents were children of immigrants, basically. So they there was that push to achieve. Yeah. So we were, you know, we had to achieve. And, um, you know, my parents didn't get to go to college. So my mother was freaked out when I left college after three years. I bailed and went on the road. Yeah. Like, Whoops! <laughs> woo! Because because I had a classical teacher who was saying you got to stop all that stuff you're doing jazz and all that, and leave that behind and become an orchestral bass player. Yeah, he didn't understand that I had only really been studying that for three years and I had been studying all this other music since I was ten. Mm -hmm. So at that point I was like around nineteen or twenty, and he wanted me to throw it all away. Mm. And just and I love classical music. I play chamber music. I've played concertos with orchestras. I love it, but that's not all I love. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I couldn't throw away everything else. And so he was really mad at me. His name was Abe Luboff. He's been he passed away a long time ago now. But I remember him saying, "When are you going to get tired of playing in those upholstered saloons?" <laughs> like he knew that I was playing in jazz clubs, you know. But that's a deep. He didn't thing, dig like it. It's a deep thing to defy expectations or to to not um, somebody's expecting something of you. Oh yeah, and then not doing it. You know that takes. But I was and... stubborn. You know, I'm uh, my my bloodline is pretty intense. I mean, you know, my grandfather on my father's side uh, came to this country on a boat when he was 16. His father died when he was five, and he was sent to his uncle's farm in Calabria to work. Wow. <laughs> so by the time he was 16, he was like, I got to get out of here. There's no, there's nothing for me here. It, it was so poor. Mm. There was nothing there to do. He was just going to, there was no possibility to forge a life that yeah. made sense to him. So things have to be pretty bad for you to get on a boat, risk being sent back. Yeah, to a different continent. Yeah, so he went all the way, landed in New York, and then had to give somebody probably all the money he had to tell the officials that, oh, yeah, he's he's my family or whatever, you know, because yeah. otherwise they send you right back if you don't have some sort of liaison when you get there. So that's how he started his journey in New York. So my father was the youngest of 11, I think. Mm, and wow. so, um, so we were tough, you know, stubborn people. So when my teacher was trying to tell me to give up jazz and all that other stuff, I had only known this guy, my teacher, for two years. I had studied with another teacher. My first classical teacher was Charles Ciani, an Italian master whose father was from the old country. His father played in the Philadelphia Orchestra, which is a big deal. And he did too a little bit. And then he wound up moving to the West Coast and he was the principal bass in the San Francisco Opera and associate principal of the symphony. So he was very intense too. But I was only with him for a year and then we moved away. So we never got to that confrontational part where they ask you to quit. Yeah. It didn't happen because we moved. He wanted me to stay, but I was too young to leave my the house yet. I was only, I was the youngest freshman at school. I was 17 in my freshman year of college until the end of the first semester. Right. Is that the stubbornness that you talked about? Is that something that you had to fight against within music also? Or is it something that you could also turn, like Wayne says, turn poison into medicine? You know, yeah, because I there's think a, God did that. There's yeah. a strength within stubbornness as well. Yes. But then there's the part where you get into trouble. And, and I did because I was stubborn. I um, The first time I got married, I was 24. Way too young. I was trying to outrun what I say is I tried to outrun what God's plan was for me. Mm -hmm. I thought I knew better. Mm -hmm. I got married and it was a terrible mistake. And 
it was oof, very bad. And it was, it really hurt me deeply. I was married almost 10 years because I believed I should stick it out and try to make it work. Mm -hmm. But my ex was um, not of the same mind. I see. Yeah. So, um, but the beautiful thing about that was that was even, you know, to use the Buddhist phrase poison into medicine, that desperation and utter, you know, I, felt, I was really, that was a bad thing for me the first time out. And I was very naive and I got hurt. So I thought after that, I could never find somebody spiritually who would be on the same page and understand the crazy life of music. Mm hmm until I met my wife, Sachi. Yeah. I had given up. I thought, I'm never going to find somebody who can deal with those both, who has all that. And there she was, you know, then she found me, kind of. Mm -hmm. And um, we've been married, it'll be 28 years in May, and we have two children and two wow. daughters. It was amazing. But so that poison was turned into medicine also. Right. Exactly. God redeemed it, you know. He redeemed that pain and suffering, and it taught me a lot. I learned, and I was stubborn. I told God, "I not, I know what I'm doing. I got it, and I got it all right." <laughs> and I didn't get what I wanted. <laughs> so uh, that's where the stubbornness. That's where you, you know, the stubbornness is a strength when when redirected in the in a positive yes. way yeah yeah if you find the right direction for it yeah yeah your wife is also on a, on a couple of your records she's and on I'll, quite a few actually yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and a really she's a great cellist yeah uh, what always rings in my ear is that that cello part i hope it's not a bass part but the cello part on scenes of an opera on remembrance oh yeah that beautiful solo that I wrote for her, she... That's, that's her, right? That's yeah. her. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the one... Those lines that happen... Yes. yes. She's killing it. And then yes, the one... Yes. What I love is that Brian is bashing over the second one. It comes in that choir, that's basses and celli. Yes. And then she's playing that... Like uh, she's killing it, and he's just bashing. I've never really heard that before. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Bashing it's kind of drums weird. And like, like a super bashing soft drums instrument. and strings. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but I was wondering right. about the about the background, the celli and the, the bass background. Um, was it planned before that would, this would be added uh, later, yes. or okay? Yes. And actually, I cued it when we were playing when we were recording. Right. It was already done that part oh okay so you can i, I the knew technician. that i wanted it i wanted it i knew i wanted to use that in this piece somehow i thought of it beforehand yeah and we recorded it uh we recorded it um separately you know and did it and then when we were in the improvisation with brian and joe i cued the the uh engineer and he played that great sort of play to it yeah but that larry layer layering of uh, of low string sounds that's something that i've heard a couple of times on records of yours is something that you've been yes. interested in and even in the film that i scored in the pandemic mm -hmm. i did some stuff like that uh what's your process on that do you compose it on the piano or um or sometimes i've i've done it that way, I think other times I just start building from the bottom and create different voicings that way. Um, it's fun to do that, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, yeah, the first time I did it on a record, one of my records, it's on sketchbook on a, rec on a tune called Two Worlds. Yes. Yeah. With Michael. Beautiful. It's like, I just listen to it today. Yeah, these clusters. I, I've been getting in touch with all these old records lately because now that I'm putting up these reels for to show people my film composition uh, things, I edit them. I put them on Pro Tools and I edit them and I make reels. Like I have one for world music, one for strings, one for solo bass electrics, one for solo bass acoustic. Um, 
different things you know mm. the, the the record that uh, one's called chamber jazz because it's stuff from you know the record one more angel with paul motion and uh alan pasqua and my wife oh, and my brother plays beautiful. steel string guitar on that record beautiful i love that album how was it to play with paul motion incredible i loved it in fact you know Before I did that record, um, my buddy Alan Pasqua, who's a brilliant pianist, what a touch. Mm -hmm. He had done some records for this Postcards label. And he had the Breckers and different people. And one of them, he had Jack, and the other one, he had Motion. And I said, man, what was it like? You know, he said, oh, man, it was amazing. He said, because I said, I'm interested. I think I want to have him on this record. He said, okay, I'll give you some advice. Don't have him rehearse. He hates rehearsing. Yeah, I was okay. going to ask. No rehearsal. Yeah. Okay. And I, you know, and I had the music and I thought, you know, he would sound great on this music anyway. That's more of a, that's the first record I made when I came back to New York. So it had one thing from the older band, like with Steve Tavalloni and John Beasley, they do that, that piece. I think it's called Beloved. Mm-hmm. Which is they improvise that i mean i mean the melody is all written and the changes but they they take it and it's beautiful steve tavalloni is very wayne-ish mm -hmm. saxophone player and he plays beautiful soprano on that and beasley is very expansive and beautifully orchestral what he does so and there's some synth on it too and stuff anyway so i got paul you know and i figured okay no rehearsal we'll just go in there and i just gonna have to trust that it's going to be great And I mean, it's Paul Motion. But what was amazing about Paul was, you know, by then he was known for his free, free-ish ECM stuff. But you know, he, he was solid as a rock with the Bill Evans trio. He was the time player in the band, like, I mean, for real. So even when we're playing freely on this record of mine, there's always this inner pulse that you he, he transmits to you, even if he's not playing all the subdivisions, you feel it. His time is so strong, but he sounds like he's floating. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Exactly. Like that first tune, Quasimodo on my record, mm -hmm. where it sounds like he's, the drum solo, it sounds like he's falling down the stairs and we're just playing an ostinato. It's incredible. I mean, I loved it. He even made some live gigs with me. Mm. When, we, when we promoted that record, we played some nights at Birdland and he played same lineup yeah i think chris played chris potter played and my wife and my brother came out and played some guitar mm. but he wouldn't leave the island of manhattan or brooklyn mm. um, he would so when we went up to uh boston to play i think uh billy billy hart played or somebody like that yeah, yeah. also a great player incredible yeah. <laughs> Wow. Um, John, if some, somebody asks you to be part of his or her project, what do you expect? What do you expect from a band leader? I mean, I, I, I guess I hope for that they will, um, you know, think about who's playing not just me but who's playing in general like and write the music where there's room for those people to really contribute who they are that's my biggest thing because i've played on so many recordings and the people who do that right get a great record every time the people that don't do that It never really, you can have all the greatest names in the world, but if you don't allow them to play and you have them in a straight jacket and you write very strict things, all very planned out and there's no room for them to breathe, you're really not getting who they are. I yeah. learned that early. Like when I, Chick had, I think I learned that from Chick too. You just choose players to play with who you already like the direction they're headed in and then you give them the space to become a better version of that. In terms of if you're hiring younger players, obviously with older musicians, I was hiring a lot of incredible older musicians. I already knew the way they played. I was just, you know, giving them a big space to be in. 
And then, of course, they were comfortable and they played incredible. Mm -hmm. Incredible stuff. So that's that's what I try to do and that's what I hope for when I join somebody's project. Mm. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, and what do you expect from... If you hire somebody um, for to be a sub or somebody, you know, what do you expect from a sub? Well, I, I forgot one, to say one thing. The other thing I expect is clean and easy to read charts. Yeah. Because I've been in situations also where there was a lot of wasted time. Yeah. Me correcting the mistakes they made in their own music. Yeah. <laughs> like, do you really want, is that supposed to be that? Oh, no, I'm sorry. You know, like it's this and that's okay but if it's happening all the time on every tune yeah you lose hours of just so i expect them to be prepared if they're going to hire if they're going to come all the way to new york and play with me and jack or somebody you know i expect them to be ready mm -hmm. you know not trying to figure it out when they get here yeah only for their sake, because I, I really help a lot. I try to help a lot. A lot of the records I'm on, I'm sometimes almost, you know, acting in a producer role, helping, you know, trying to help them, you know, helping them calm down if they're nervous. Yeah. Help, I mean, I think it's part of bass playing. Mm -hmm. Bass player is usually the peacemaker. He should be, or she. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's the way I look at it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And then, so if somebody stubs on my group, I, I expect them to be early. I expect them to be, know the music. I expect them to be a team person, all of that. Yeah. Those are basic professionalism kind of details. Yeah. Very important. Um, let's talk about, um, I've talked about this with Danilo as well. And with some of the players who actually did it, um, with you guys. So with the Wayne Shorter Quartet, there were instances when great people were subbing, you know? Of course, Terry Lynn and Jorge, uh, yeah, Jonathan yeah, yeah. Pinson, and uh, and uh, of course, um, Jeffrey Kieser and, and uh, Jason Moran, people like that. Um, how did it feel for you in a tight organization like this and with this incredible unique music with Wayne, how did the dynamic change for you? And how did you see maybe your role change and uh, your impressions of these moments? Yeah, we just tried to help. If it was Brian and I, we were trying to help the pianist. I would say Jeff Kieser came very prepared and did a real strong job of trying to, you know, just really... Um, It's not really a band where you can have subs at all. So that's all I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> Except yeah, for yeah. Jeff. But even still, I mean, you know, Danilo, his presence in that band is so huge. Yeah. Um, like I say, he's one of the two people who really have in you know really really spent years inside wayne's harmonic world yeah you know there are other people who have spent many years in wayne's harmonic world but they didn't get to play with wayne so it's different when you're in that mm -hmm. and it's happening around you and it changes your dna over the years it just realigns your whole life mm -hmm. playing that music but i would say from my perspective in terms of being playing when somebody else came to play the one person who actually made it work the best was Jeff Kieser. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Because, you know, that's the hardest chair to replace in this band because there's so much. I mean, it was, I think it was very difficult with the drums for me. You can't really tell somebody what to play. Oh yeah, Brian and I always they're not gonna it's it's unfair. Yeah. Brian is so unique. You know. 
And you'd have to ask Danilo about the base situations. There was a f couple of yeah. them. Yeah, exactly. And we talked. About I'm sure he told you, but yeah. maybe he didn't. Maybe. <laughs> no, I also talked about it with uh, Scott Collier. Talked about his uh, perspective on how it, you know, how it was. He did a very you good know. job. There's a record of that, even like. Uh, really? I mean, yes. Um, let me see. I mean, a recording that somebody released. Do you know this one? No, that's a bootleg. Oh no! Wait, this is this is Christian McBride, uh, and it's not with Scott Colley, I think. No, Scott I have, did I have that week. I couldn't be there. Scott did the quartet. No, Scott did the stuff with the orchestra, and Christian did the quartet. Yeah, yeah. And then there was another time I think Bob Hurst subbed for me too. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and. Um, what, I really what like these... his playing a lot. Oh yeah, he's he's incredible. I I want to talk to more about uh, when you make records. I really like this the sequencing sequencing on the record. So so the track order and how that that story unfolds within uh, a record. Yeah, that's always pain painstaking. Like, how are we going to do this? You know. So, um, and often, if we get it right, it, it helps. When I do live gigs, sometimes I would use the same order for the. <laughs> for the gig mm -hmm. but um i don't have a specific science like um people like pat metheny are famous for having like a real thought out way to do it like and brecker used to tell me if you ever have a problem with your sequencing of your record just send it to pat he's really good he'll fix it for you you know but i i kind of like to do it myself yeah does it keep you up at night sometimes uh not that bad but it 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 is it can happened be to frustrating. me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it happened to me. Just trying to go to sleep and thinking about ah, but then this song and could lead yeah, yeah, into yeah. you know. Just I'm sure it's close to that for me, if I'm honest. I don't know that it kept me up at night, but it definitely drove me crazy. I'm gonna have to go soon though because I have a engineer coming over, so I gotta get ready for that. But um. Of course, man. I could talk to you, like I said yesterday, we could talk every day for, you know, weeks yes. and have a lot of fun. But I wish I had more time for that, but I I don't. But, um, oh, you know, thank who you knows? So Stay in touch. Um, yes. And who knows? Maybe someday we'll play together. Oh, man. I I, um, I don't know what to say about that, but this would be a dream come true for me, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I love your playing. And it feels so thank close you. because I have listen to you for so many times seen your life so many times um so you know what i i, I once played I, I played with john schofield you know and uh, oh, oh he's he, one of my heroes he joined my trio and when i then got to play with him it felt so close because i had been playing yes. along to his records all the time so yes you know <laughs> do you know this feeling of getting oh, to yeah. play with your heroes and then uh it feels actually like you've been doing it for a long time well that record now, mm -hmm. basically, I almost recreated his whole band. I just exactly. put me in it. It was Bill Stewart and him and I. I couldn't use Lovano; that would have been too much. So I used, you know, Michael and Chris. Yep. To make it different. But Could that have was used Dennis Irwin, though. You know, you... <laughs> <laughs> and just listened. Wow, yeah. cool. <laughs> um, but uh, I love Dennis Irwin. He was a yeah. sweetheart very yes. special human being and great bass player um yes but yeah that 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 was incredible for me because i had transcribed his solos and i'm a huge sco head and, yeah. and and on one of my records we did that tune Schofield. called sco file yeah. sco file yeah Schofield. exactly yeah. Yeah, great song great real. song yes and also yes. he played on that tune they heard it twice yes uh, beautiful beautiful which even had a, had a, had even had a um a title like his titles and it came on the session because we were saying oh should we play the melody here again and i was like no nah, they already heard it twice and then we went wait a minute they heard it twice yeah so i love those keyboard voicings in uh, you know in the in the back john beasley Ooh. john beasley is an incredible very killing i mean he was part of my band for years yeah very deep like his intros are amazing mm -hmm. like there's a um there's a song called Soul Song on Mr. Afina, the Brazilian record, 
with and it's Yvonne Linz is singing, you know, it's the one that goes mm-hmm. da, 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 da. but it starts off with this like this amazing like intro on the piano. It sounds like some sort of I don't know. Um it's it's like a a, a fanfare, you know, like mm. he comes in playing this expansive thing. You know, he's a very underrated piano player. Mm. Beautiful. I think. Yeah, he's great. He's great. I mean, people know him, of course, they love him, but in my band, he, he, I mean, there were many, many nights where he just played insane intros and so, I mean, he's really great. The other night I played with him, we played, I, I hadn't played with him in a long time on a, on a live gig and he came to New York with his Monkestra, that mm, group, right? and it was the small band version with a, like a four or five horns and then the trio mm. and we played and he did some intros again they were like incredible yeah yeah so yeah yeah he played some really cool voicings on that on the synth exactly and, and sounds also, yeah cool the, synth the sounds. sounds that he found and they really help the melody but they add something that is so interesting and so oh, i want to know more about these sounds you know so it's yeah, yeah, yeah. really really great but the song itself feels like you cr- created the su- su- such a great playground for sco to be sco yeah yeah, yeah yeah well also on sco file exactly crazy kind of like those stabs i think they were they were that was john beasley and david with him who was mm. also like i told you yesterday he had studied with jackie byard he was like right. a great jazz piano player but also they got they both got into synths and i think they were very influenced by zavinul yes and all yes. that who wasn't yeah. He was still, to me, of all the guys that were, you know, that came out of Miles, he he forged another thing with the synths in a way that <coughs> was so personal. Yes. So warm and orchestral, too. Yes. Very special. It never sounded electric with him. It always no. sounded like natural. That's why Weather Report, Weather Report was so insane. So Yeah. Good. Anyway, I got to go. Of course. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> See Man. you tomorrow. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that would be funny if all yeah. of a sudden I, oh, I open up my computer tomorrow and there you yeah. are. Wait a minute. How did you get in there? <laughs> all right, man. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much. See you again. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.